The Jack Benny Program, presented by Lucky Strike. Six From first puff to last, there's never a rough puff in a Lucky. Yes, from the very first puff, you get smooth, mild, smoking enjoyment. The rich, mellow taste of fine tobacco. Because L.S. M.F.T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. And in a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. Now, fine tobacco costs more. And at the auctions, luckies pay more, millions of dollars more than official parity prices to get fine, light, naturally mild tobacco. Tobacco that smokes cool and smooth with never a rough puff. The independent tobacco experts can see the makers of Lucky Strike consistently select and buy ripe, mellow leaf. And a recent survey shows more of these experts, auctioneers, buyers, and warehousemen, smoke Lucky Strike regularly than the next two leading brands combined. That's a tip for you, friends, for your greater enjoyment of smoking. Yes, for a smoother, milder smoke with never a rough puff. Smoke the smoke tobacco expert smoke. Lucky Strike. So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. <laughs> Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. (laughs) And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's go back a few hours. It's just before our regular Sunday rehearsal, and Jack is in his dressing room waiting for his guest star to appear. Oh, Rochester, has Fred Allen arrived yet? No, sir. Uh, Say, boss, Mr. Allen has been off the air for a long time, hasn't he? Yes, yes, he has. Well, you and he never did get along. How come you're having him on your program? Well, Rochester, I'll admit it took me a long time to make up my mind. I didn't feel sorry for Mr. Allen when he lost his job, and I wasn't particularly upset when he was evicted from his house. (laughs) But last week, when I saw him standing on the corner of Sunset and Doheny, selling maps to movie stars home, (laughs) I wept. He looked awful standing out there selling those maps. His suit was so ragged, it looked like he bought it one flight up and then fell down the stairs. No kidding, boss. Does he really look that bad? Rochester, you won't believe this, but Alan is so weak that he's talking through his mouth now. (laughs) He hasn't the strength to push the words up through his nose. (laughs) Oh, it's pathetic. Pathetic. Well, then, under the circumstance, I suppose you're going to give him a very generous check. Well, a man should never let his sympathies override his good judgment in business. I'm going to pay him according to the number of laughs he gets. Then you'd better watch it, boss. He's liable to live himself right into the upper bracket. <laughs> Listen, Alan couldn't ad-lib the word please if it was preceded by give me a package of Beeman's Peps and Chewing Gum. <laughs> so I'm not worried about what he's oh, like. Oh, Jack. What is it, Don? Well, uh, everyone's out on stage waiting for you. Oh, good, good. Has Fred Allen come in yet? Well, not yet. Oh, well, I'll be out in a minute. Oh, 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 boss. Uh, why are you rehearsing? Do you want me to make out the payroll like I always do? Yes, Rochester. And on Don Wilson's check, deduct 50 cents. 50 cents? Yes, and on the stub, make a notation. Deduction for DP. DP? What does that stand for? Drear Poussin. <laughs> He'll understand. Well, I better get out on the stage. See you later, Rochester. Gee, that Los Angeles Open Golf Tournament sure was exciting. My legs are still sore from following Hogan and Sneed. That was silly to follow such good players. They never lose any balls. Now, fellas, before we try that number again, I want to make a few changes. First trumpet. In the third measure, change the F sharp to an A flat. Phil. Just a minute, Jackson. Uh, Now, in the second sax, in that first measure following the coda, change the D flat to an E natural. Look, Phil. Now, tenor sax, clarinet, and flute, right after the andante, give me a little more pianissimo. Phil. Now, let's have it. One, two. That's 
exactly what I want. <laughs> Phil? Phil, what was that? Some enchanted evening. <laughs> Phil, that was some enchanted evening? Sure. And that's the way you're going to play it on my program? Certainly. Well, Phil, Phil. Yeah. If some enchanted evening you should meet a stranger, ask him for a job. <laughs> that was the worst. Wait a minute, Jackson. I forgot the most important change of all. Oh, I'm sorry. Joe, turn your trombone around. You're blowing in the wrong end. <laughs> I wondered when you noticed that he's been doing it since 1936. <laughs> Phil, if I were you, I'd worry less about the music and more. Jack, Jack, let's get on with the rehearsal. Well, we'll start when Alan gets here. Is Fred Allen going to be our guest? Certainly, Mary. I told you last week. I thought you were kidding. Getting Fred Allen is no surprise to me. What? I could see the handwriting on the wall. <laughs> Dennis. You're in the middle of your season. You've got to start getting laughs, kid. <laughs> Now, look. Some Sundays I'm ashamed to go home. <laughs> Wait a minute, Dennis. There's nothing for you to be ashamed of about my program. I happen to be one of the country's outstanding comedians. Some comedian. You couldn't ad lib the word please if it was preceded by give me a package of Beeman's Peps and Chewing Gum. <laughs> Dennis. Dennis, where'd you hear that? On Groucho Marx's program, Wednesday night. <laughs> Oh, yes, it, it was pretty good, wasn't it? Yeah, I like the part where Groucho said Fred Allen is so weak he has to talk through his mouth Dennis, because... shut up <laughs> What a kid Jack What? I just look over the script and from the jokes I've got You must have stolen from Death of a Salesman What? I haven't got one good gag in the whole show Well, it's your own fault, Mary I had a very funny routine in there about your sister, Babe And you made me take it out Of course I did The horrible things you make me say about her About Babe? Certainly One week she's a model in a harness shop Next week she's a hostess on a live bait barge (laughs) (laughs) And the following week she's a sewer inspector at Pismo Beach (laughs) Well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? People think she can't hold a job. (laughs) Oh, well, then we won't tell any more jokes like that about Babe. And you can stop talking about her looks, too. Now, wait a minute, Mary. Even though it is your sister, let's face it, she never was exactly voted Miss America. No, but she came close. Close? Mr. America. (laughs) Oh, yes. Gabby Hayes came in second, I remember (laughs) Anyway, Mary, if you object so strenuously to what we say about Babe, we'll leave it out of the Well, say, Jack, it's getting kind of late. Can't we rehearse without Alan? No, we can't, Don. Well, say, Mr. Benny, as long as we have to wait, would you like to hear my song first? Well, yes, Dennis, you might have... Oh, wait a minute. That reminds me of something. Now, go ahead, Dennis. Sing your song, will you? Jack. What? What was that? Well, during our murder mystery last week, the quartet was supposed to sing that, and at one point they got it so mixed up that nothing came out. It was just awful. Oh, so you're making them sing it today, huh, Jack? Five hundred times. But they won't bother us. They have to stay in that closet until they finish. But, Jack, the four of them in such a small closet. Well, that's part of the punishment, Mary. They can't stand each other, you know. Well, I don't think they're crazy enough to sing that same thing five hundred times. You don't think so? Listen to this. You see? Now, Dennis, go ahead and sing your song. Five hundred times? No, only one. Things may look very dark Your 
tomorrow You will suddenly hear child And you'll have your happy, happy Very good, Dennis, and when you do it on the show, I'll say that was Dennis Day singing Happy Times from Danny Kaye's new picture, The Inspector General, starring Danny Kaye. The song was written by Mrs. Danny Kaye and sung in the picture by Mr. Danny Kaye. There, I guess that'll take care of the Christmas present I forgot to send them. <laughs> uh, now, kids, let's try and... Ellis, 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 yes, sir, Hey! Dennis, get away from that door. Jack, you've got to stop this. One of the fellows in the quartet look exhausted. Must be the tenor. They never do hold up. <laughs> but maybe I ought to take a look. Ellis, 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 and 15 pieces, more for fine tobacco. They're all right, Mary. Are you sure? Certainly, I'll show you. Yes, sir. Hey! <laughs> you see, they're fine. Now, look, kids, I've made up my mind. If Alan doesn't get here for rehearsal in the next ten minutes, I'm going to cancel him. I wonder where he can be. He hasn't any friends out here. Maybe. I don't know. Will it be anything else, Mr. Allen? Uh, yes, waiter. I'll have another cup of coffee. You know, Mr. Allen, before I took this job here at the Brown Derby, I was a waiter at Lindy's. Really? Now, how are things back in New York? Well, they're about the same, except we have a water shortage, you know. Oh, yeah, I've been reading about that. Did it affect you personally? Well, it didn't bother me much at first, but after several weeks, something told me to take a bath. <laughs> You do? Well, every day I'd lunch at the automat, and while the nickel changer wasn't watching, I would slyly pilfer half a glass of water, which I would take home and pour into my bathtub. Yeah? Then on Tuesday evenings, I would visit my friends, and while they were listening to my jokes on Milton Berle's program, <laughs> I would siphon a little water out of their goldfish bowl. Uh -huh. Oh, I used many other ingenious methods of collecting moisture. When pigeons weren't looking, I would raise them up slowly and drop my handkerchief into their bird baths. <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd follow window washers through the Empire State Building to catch their drippings. <laughs> and I would purposely irritate little boys so they'd squirt their water pistols at them. <laughs> Well, finally, after much waiting and hard labor, I had collected four precious inches of aqua pura in my bathtub. And then you took your bath? Oh, no, I rented it out. I'm not working, you know. <laughs> See, that's right. Uh, how come you're not on a radio anymore? Well, you may have heard, overheard uh, gossip. You know, radio is, is highly competitive. And the program that used to be opposite me was a giveaway show. Now, I don't know how it happened, but on the last Sunday in June, they gave me away. <laughs> no. Yes. I was prize number seven. I came between a plastic zither and a year's supply of strong hot dog food. <laughs> Gee, Mr. Allen, if you're through with radio, then you must be out to make a picture. No, no, I am not, my inquisitive little straight man. <laughs> I am here, I am, this is confidential, you know, I am here as a personal emissary of Mayor O'Dwyer to ask Jack Benny to come to our troubled city on March 15th. Why did they want Frank there on March the 15th? Because when Benny pays his income tax, his tears alone will fill every reservoir and... <laughs> Oh, 
reminds me, Mr. Allen, aren't you supposed to be on Jack Benny's program today? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> and how I hate it. Well, this is none of my business, but uh, how much is Benny going to pay you? Well, I don't know yet, but my lawyer filed suit against him two weeks ago. <laughs> Well, wait a minute. You ain't even been on his program yet, and you started suing him two weeks ago? My friend, when you deal with Benny, it's always best to get a running start. <laughs> you mean he's really that cheap? Cheap? Why, Benny is so tight that last summer when he was out on a dude ranch, he kept his money in a wildcat's mouth. <laughs> and he was snide enough to find a wildcat with tonsillitis so it couldn't swallow. <laughs> I'd better get going. I, I have to go to that old man's rehearsal over there. Say, uh, which network is he lousing up now? Oh, he's at CBS. It's just two blocks from here. Say, on second thought, you know, I think I'll let him stew a little while. Bring me another cup of coffee. <laughs> I can't understand what's keeping Fred. Oh, Jack, take it easy. He'll be here any minute. Well, when we go to court, I'm certainly going to bring up about him being late. <laughs> oh, Rochester, will you run out and see if you can find Mr. Allen? Maybe he's at Lyman's or at the Derby. Somewhere. Yes, sir. Alice, 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 Alice. What? Wrong door. <laughs> That Allen is certainly a thoughtless guy. He's been doing things like this to me since the first day I met him. Jack, I've been with you for so many years, and I never knew how you first met Fred Allen. Oh, it happened in Boston a long time ago. Well, tell me about it, Jack. All right, Don. It was many, many years ago when vaudeville was at its height. I was the headliner at the Metropolitan Theater in Boston. One night after the supper show, I was sitting in my dressing room resting from my seven encores. I was removing my makeup. Gosh, they were a wonderful audience tonight. They made me take seven bows. This makeup is hard to get off. Uh-oh. Tia, gray hair. Imagine me getting gray. This is the first year I'm 39. <laughs> well, I'll just... Come in. Uh, Mr. Benny? Yes? Uh, Mr. Benny, my name is Fred Allen. Uh-huh. I'm appearing here at the uh, Metropolitan. Well, that's funny. I don't remember any Fred Allen on this bill. I'm in the opening act. Oh, I thought the opening act was Fink's Mules. I took my makeup off. <laughs> oh, so you're with Fink's Mules? Uh-huh. May I sit down? Yes, but not too close. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, uh, what can I do for you, young man? Well, Mr. Benny, I am a great admirer of yours, sir, and I want to be a smart, sophisticated comedian like you. Oh, then... You're a comedian? Yes, I'm just mule delineating for the time being, I said. <laughs> I am really a juggler, but I want to give up juggling because you can't get any steady booking. Oh, I don't know. Now, my brother worked for a bank, juggled their books, and got 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> you see, if you want to be a comedian, Alan, you better watch it. You see, you let that one get past you. Oh, it didn't get past me, Mr. Benny. I've been around mules so long, I didn't notice it. <laughs> Well, Mr. Allen, if you're a juggler, I hardly think you have the experience to become a great comedian. Oh, sir, I never hope to be as great as you are, sir. But I do think with a little perseverance and some polish, mark you, I might become another Maury Amsterdam. <laughs> well, you should be able to get laughs, Allen. You're ugly enough. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Benny, what do you think of this new entertainment medium that's just starting up, this thing called radio? Well, I've been giving it a lot of thought. In fact, I already have an idea for a radio program. You have? Yes. On my program each week, I'll visit a place called Benny's Boulevard, where I'll start knocking on doors and ask topical questions of four people. Four people? Yes, a southern senator, oh. a rube who says howdy, bub, oh. a Bronx housewife, and an Irishman. Gosh, what a novel idea for radio. You know, that might even replace the street singer. <laughs> yes. You'll have to excuse me now, Alan. I've got to get dressed for dinner. Well, goodbye, Mr. Benny. And thank you so much, sir, for your help. I will always treasure the memory of this meeting. Meeting the greatest comedian in the world, sir. I'm backing thank out, you. sir. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 
And that, Don, is how I first met Fred Allen and why I dislike him so much. Jack, you mean... Yes, he stole my radio idea and called it Allen's Alley. Gee, I wonder if Rochester has found him yet. Say, waiter, I'll have another cup. Oh, there you are, Mr. Allen. I've been looking all over for you. Oh, hello, Rochester. Say, I was just getting ready to go over to the studio. Well, let's hurry, Mr. Bentley's awful upset. Come on, I'll show you the shortcut to CBS. Sure. You know, Rochester, I'm rather surprised to see that you're still Mr. Benny's valet. I thought you'd quit long ago. Oh, it ain't such a bad job. I get my three meals a day, and I don't work too hard, and I have a nice place to sleep. Well, I know, but what about money? Pardon? (laughs) Money? What what happens on payday? He gives me a whip and a chair and tells me to get it from the wildcat. After all these years, Rochester, you'd think Benny would change. But he's just as bad as when I first met him in Boston many years ago. I never did hear about how you two first met. Uh, would you tell me about it, Mr. Allen? Well, are you really interested, are you? Uh-huh. Well, I shall be glad to tell you, Rochester. Uh, before you start, we'll, we'll, we'll take this shortcut. We'll go through the parking lot at NBC, which will lead us to the back door of CBS. Uh, that way we can... Who was that? Bill Harris. <laughs> Now, Mr. Allen, tell me about how you first met Mr. Benny. Well, Rochester, it happened many, many years ago. I was headlining at the Metropolitan Theater in Boston. And one evening after the supper show, I was sitting in my dressing room removing my makeup. Oh, Gad, what a show. I'm all tired out from blowing kisses to the audience. Eleven encores before I finally begged off. Come in. Uh, Mr. Allen? Yes? Uh, My name is Jack Benny. Well, I'm glad you got here. It's the cold water faucet that's leaking. (laughs) No, no, I'm not the plumber. See, I'm appearing here on the vaudeville bill with you. Jack Benny, Jack. Say, I I didn't see your name on the program. Oh, I'm in the opening act. But the show opens with a Japanese flash act. Yamaguchi and Takamura. Gosh, they're wonderful. The way they lie on their backs and juggle that big barrel with their feet. I know. And inside of that barrel, me. (laughs) No. Oh, yes, Mr. Allen. While they're balancing that barrel and kicking it up in the air, I'm curled up inside with my violin, playing Ireland Must Be Heaven because my mother came from there. (laughs) What an inspired touch. I can just hear that music... Coming out through the bunghole. (laughs) Well, so much for flattery. Now, what can I do? What can I do for you, son? Mr. Allen, sir, you've got to help me. I want to be a great comedian like you. I want to make a lot of money. A lot of money. But, Benny, why knock yourself out to make a lot of money? You'll only spend it. (laughs) No, no, Mr. Allen. I saved my money. Here, look. Say, that's a peculiar-looking wallet you have there. It's a baby wildcat. (laughs) It has a strep throat. (laughs) Anyway, Mr. Allen, I want to be a great comedian like you. Well, if you're so anxious to earn big money, why don't you turn to radio? Radio? Yes, it's a gold mine. Say, I'm working on an idea for a program for myself. Now, my idea is this. I'll be the star, you see, and I'll have a valet, a very naive young boy singer, a girl to insult me, a drunken orchestra leader, and a fat announcer. (laughs) Gee, that sounds like a wonderful idea, Mr. Allen, and I hope you have a lot of luck with it. Goodbye. And that's how I first met your boss, Rochester. You mean... Yes, Rochester. Mr. Benny stole my radio idea, crawled out of his barrel, said goodbye to Yamaguchi and Takamura, crawled out through the bunghole, (laughs) became a big success on the air, sold himself to CBS for $2 million, while today, I am a bum. (laughs) How fickle fate can be. 
Well, here's the studio, Mr. Allen. Let's go in. No. No, Rochester. I can't go in. What? I can't do it, Rochester. I can't let Benny give me a job. I may be a derelict down and out, but I've still got my pride. But, Mr. Allen... No, I'm sorry, Rochester. I just can't do it. But, Mr. Allen, you haven't got any money. How are you going to live? Don't worry about me. I'll get along. Maps! Get your maps to the movie star at home. <laughs> James Mason, Ronald Coleman, Mr. and Mrs. Gary Cooper, Mr. and Mrs. Robert Taylor. You can't tell me... back in just a moment, but first... There's never a rough puff in the Lucky because Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Yes, sold to American. That's a familiar cry at the auctions when fine tobacco comes up for sale. For at market after market, the buyers for Lucky Strike go after fine, light, naturally mild tobacco. Tobacco they know will give you a milder, smoother smoke with never a rough puff. Now, fine tobacco like this costs more, and luckies pay more, millions of dollars more than official parity prices to get light, ripe tobacco for your cigarette. No doubt about it, L.S., M.F.T., Lucky Strike means fine tobacco, and it takes fine tobacco to make a fine cigarette. So for the real deep-down smoking enjoyment that only fine tobacco can give you, light up as lucky. Puff by puff, you'll see there's never a rough puff in a lucky. Good reason to make your next carton Lucky Strike. Mary, that's the worst thing anybody ever did to me. I'll never forgive Fred for not showing up. Oh, Jack, stop complaining. You had a good program without him. I know, but how could he do a thing like that? All right. Don't walk so fast. I can't keep up with you. Okay. Hey, mister, would you like to buy a map to the movie star's homes? Don't you talk to me. Stupid man. <laughs> Come on, Mary. Well, you might at least say hello to Portland. She's on the other corner. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hello, Portland. How are they going? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, somewhere there's a boy. A boy who needs affection, advice, and guidance. But most of all, a boy needs a friend, a big brother. So why not you? Observe National Big Brother Week by volunteering your services now. Contact Big Brothers at Broad Street Station Building, Philadelphia 3, Pennsylvania. And be sure to hear Dennis Day in a day in the life of Dennis Day. Stay tuned for the Amos and Andy Show, which follows immediately. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> 